are starting up a new series called Relationship Goals. We are just coming out of a series called Guardrails. This was a, man, a series really designed just to help us begin the new year by putting up some wise parameters. If you're like me, when you go bowling, I put up the bumpers, haters gonna hate, whatever, my score's better and I have more fun, so that's on you. Um, And that's what Guardrails was about, uh, about putting up some healthy bumpers in your life. We were going to do a weekend on uh, relationships in that. We decided that since it's such an enormous subject, it doesn't deserve a Sunday. It deserves a whole series. So we're spending the month of February talking about relationships, talking about relationship goals today. Why goals? Because you got them. I've got them. We've all got goals. We've got ideas. At least we've got ambitions as to where do we want to go with our various relationships. Uh, In our mind's eye, the perfect man, the perfect woman is like this. The relationship with them is like this. With my friends, it's like this. You've got goals in your head. We're going to try to explore those and more importantly, find out how to get there. Uh, So it's like this. For, For me right now, three critical relationships. Number one, it is my spouse. And so this is a goal uh, that I have is with my wife. Maybe for you, your goal is to find a spouse right now. That is not a bad goal. That's pretty cool. It's a lot of work, but it's a great goal. Totally worth it. Um, So my goal for my spouse right now, you know, one of the, the big things for Nikki and I is we, we have uh, almost a seven-year-old and an 11-year-old. We've been married, we've been married 13 years, right? I said, I, I may have said 12 last service. I just stuttered a lot up here um, when that was said right off the top. So I've got work to do, apparently. But we're in an interesting place right now with, with being like full-blown. We've got, we got a lot of, having kids is a lot of work. We got one in preteen years and all that good stuff. We're in an interesting place because it would be very, very easy to slip into a place in our marriage where we are kind of business partners of little Tremonti Enterprise in our own home, and we are business partners in raising children right now. And we've got to be really careful to where here in 10 years, when the girls leave the house and they do their own thing, that we don't look at each other and go, who are you again? Well, what do we do now? And so we've got to be really, really intentional as to being friends right now, not just business partners, not just raising kids together, uh, but being best friends with one another. That's an enormous goal that we have because I want to be like Gary and Rhonda. I I saw them last night, been married over 50 years, driving up to Cayucas to go have lunch with each other because they, you know, being at home with each other is fun, but why not go get lunch together because we like each other that much? That's what I want us to be like. And so that's some goals for us right there. Thanks, Gary and Rhonda, for helping us set that. So spouse is a goal. My wife is my enormous goal. Another goal for us is our kids, of course. And so we got two little girls. And with this one, we actually have some language as to what is our intent with our daughters. What Nikki and I want to do, what our aim, what our goal with our kids is we know that we're not just raising kids, we're raising adults. They are kids now, they will be adults. And it's our job to send out functioning adults, right, that are going to contribute to the world and the kingdom of God. So we say what we're wanting to do is to raise wise, church-engaged adults. That's our goal. Church engaged implies that they have such a personal love for Christ that it spills over into what they do inside of the local church and furthering God's kingdom to go forward. Wise, because there's too many dumb people that are being cranked out and God forbid that we don't help right the wrong a little bit and we are able to uh, put out there some adults that know how to make wise decisions, right? Do you want your kids to be wise? Me too. That's our goal. Uh, Nikki's a goal. Kids are a goal. Another goal that I have is friends. What I want to do as a young man, I want to surround myself with other young men who are pursuing God, other young men who are going to help me be a better man. I want to surround myself with friends that are in the next stage of life that are 5, 10, 15, 20 years older than me that I would call my friends, some people that I can look up to, uh, some people that would speak into my life and really challenge me to be a better 
husband, would challenge me to be a better father, would challenge me to be a better pastor. So it is a goal that I intentionally surround myself and I make time, because that's where it comes to, that I would make time to spending uh, quality time, intentional time with those friends and give them place to challenge me. So I've got goals, you've got goals too. It's not for a lack of goals that we don't get to where we want to be, (laughs) but there is often a big disconnect between knowing the goal and then getting to the goal, right? In fact, I I love this proverb. This is Proverbs chapter four, verse 19. Check this out. Here's what it says. The way of the wicked. Wicked is like a, a legal term here. It means one that is accused, the the way of the one that has rebelled against God, the one that has said, hey, God, we want to do it our own way, which scripture says is all of us. This is like the default uh, position of the nature of the human heart is of wickedness, of rebelling against God. So it says the way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what they stumble over. One of the things that I am so grateful for Nikki for is that she primarily takes our kids to birthday parties. I do not like going to children's birthday parties for numerous reasons. It's awkward. I'm having weird small talk. I'm usually pinned up in a corner. And often there's chaos at these parties. When it's my kid's party, I'm totally cool with it. Because if there's chaos, you know who gets to take care of it? Me. But when I'm at somebody else's party and it's chaos and they like chaos... I don't do very good at that. So I try to stay away from those. Thank God our kids are a little bit older to where we can kind of drop them off and pick them back up later now. But Nikki would often, you know, often takes the kids to parties. Uh, But one of the things that if I do have to go to a party that I enjoy (laughs) being around all that insanity is watching kids play pin the tail on the donkey or whatever themed version they're doing because it's one of the few times where it's socially acceptable as an adult to openly laugh at children. And I like to take advantage of that opportunity too. You know, you put the blindfold on them, you spin them around and they go in the totally wrong direction and knocking over lamps and stuff. That's hilarious. I love that. It's a little bit of joy for me in those uncomfortable situations. But too many of us play relational pin the tail on the donkey, right? So let's keep this scripture in mind. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what they stumble over. How many of us, is that describe our pursuit of different relationship goals? We have the goals. Maybe we can even verbalize the goals, but it's like we've got a blindfold up and it's like we've been spun around, right? And we know what we want that relationship with our spouse to look like, our friends to look like, with our kids to look like, but we're, we're just walking around. Scripture says, in fact, we even stumble, right? And then we get there and think, all right, this is it. <laughs> and we realize that not only have we totally missed the mark and we missed our goal, but we've accidentally stumbled upon another goal here. <laughs> and we find ourselves, I don't know, hanging out with Raiders fans, apparently. <laughs> We find ourselves doing things that Raiders fans do, like robbing little old ladies and stabbing people in the Walmart parking lot, just normal Raiders activities, right? (laughs) You like that? (laughs) But let's just put in this target, this little eye patch dude right here, with relationships that we've kind of stumbled up in and we've held on to. We were trying to get there and we got here with her, with him, with them. I wanted those friends, but now I'm with these guys. I wanted that girl, but now I'm with her. I wanted that relationship with my kids, but now I'm, I'm the pirate. I've distanced myself from them. Too many of us, like playing a game of pin the tail on the donkey, end up wandering around, not hitting our goals. So what are we then to do? Well, the verse before this sheds a little bit of light on that, no pun intended, check this out. Proverbs 4.18, it says, but the path of the righteous, those who are in right standing with God, those who love Christ, who have put their trust and hope in him, what are they like? Well, the paths of the righteous, it's like the light of dawn. 
When you look out and you see the sun, its beams coming over the hills, right, to our east. We see that and the light begins to fill up the sky. It says that shines brighter and brighter until full day, that we're not stumbling around in darkness, but it should be to where things are illuminated and it gets more and more clear so we know what path to go down to hit our goals and not end up somewhere where we don't want to hit. The book of Proverbs is all about wisdom. And in this chapter where these verses are are nestled, Proverbs 4, they're about wisdom. Wisdom is that light, but not just any wisdom. It's wisdom that comes from God. In the longest chapter of the Bible, Psalm 119, 105, it says this. Your word, meaning scripture, what we call the Bible, Your word, O Lord, it's a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. It takes the blindfold off and it gives me wisdom to see so I can hit the goals that I have relationally. That's what we're going to be talking about in this series. We're going to be opening up the word of God, finding out how to get to these different goals. Does that sound good? Let's pray and we'll hop into it. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. We don't want our wisdom, we certainly don't want a blindfold, but we want your wisdom and we're asking you. We are seeking it today. You've said ask and we'll receive. We just sang that. Today we're asking that you would enlighten the eyes of our understanding. Your word is a lamp to our feet, a light into our path. Guide us today in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to look at the very first relationship in scripture. What's fun about in scripture is it gives you a lot of what not to do. So uh, as you read through this, there's a lot of relational mess up. So if you're like, oh man, like I've made a lot of relational mistakes, good news, read the Bible because it's weirder than anything you've done, guaranteed. Go to read through it and you're gonna see a lot of relational mistakes. But instead of reading those, we're gonna go to the very first relationship. These will be the creation accounts in Genesis chapter one, chapter two. We'll start in Genesis 1:26. here it goes. Then God said, this would be day six, Let us make man in our image. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So right here we see God. He creates this earth and then he creates humanity. He creates man and woman and puts them into his creation. And it would appear that that is the first relationship, making a man and a woman. They're obviously going to be in relationship with one another. another. That would be the first relationship. But there is a relationship that precedes this. And there's a clue in this verse. And you've probably seen it because it reads like weird English. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image. Who is us? Who is our? Who is God talking to? Well, it's right here. So God created. So God is the us. He is the our in this passage. God is relational in himself, in who he is. In his being, God is relational. This is the fun doctrine of the Trinity, which is at the bedrock, at the very core of of our faith, and is one of the most difficult, in fact, not difficult, incomprehensibly hard uh, doctrines to wrap your mind around because we're trying to imagine a God that is outside of our world, outside of our understanding, and outside of our thinking. And so if this leaves you kind of like scratching your head a little bit, welcome to the club. That is totally fine. One, One of the things that Uh, has helped me understand a little bit of the nature of the Trinity. And when I say the the Trinity, I mean, there's God the Father, there's God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. They are three persons who forever exist in as the nature of God, as as the person of who we call God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Confusing, totally. Timothy Keller, a pastor in New York City, talks about this, and he, he likens the nature of the Trinity, when we say God, he likens that to a dance. And when you think about a dance, which I know nothing about, but I know this, that when you move, your partner moves with you. 
And I would assume that if you're dancing with three people, well, one moves and they all kind of move and they're all synchronized up with one another. It's the nature of the Trinity is that God in himself is relational. He is community in himself, right? And so you have God the Father forever existing with and in and serving the Son and the Spirit. You have the Son forever serving the Father and the Spirit, the Spirit forever existing and serving the Father and the Son. They're in one accord, one a step with one another. So God in himself is community. That's the very first relationship is in the very nature of God himself. And that's so important when we see God creating us because it shows us what, uh, what the reason that was, what the reason God did not create us for. It's important to find out why did he make us, but it's also important to find out why did he not make us. And one of the reasons he did not make us is to re- fill some relational void on the inside of him. Because if God is needing to make humanity so that he cannot be lonely, then that means God was lacking something. But God cannot lack anything. That's why even in his own nature, there's no lack of community or relationship. He's God, self-sustaining, full of joy and love in himself for all of time and eternity. So then what does that tell us? That God didn't make us because he needed to get love from us. God created us because he had love to pour out onto us. Do you see the massive difference there? It's it's not like, (laughs) mom and dad, you're probably watching, love you guys, but it's not like when uh, when I left the house and I was replaced by a dog, right? (laughs) Any of you have that happen? You were replaced? (laughs) There's a little something missing. I was replaced with a chihuahua. Watson replaced me. Four years later, my sister did the same thing. She also got replaced by another chihuahua there. That's not God. He doesn't need anything like that. He's not trying to, God has so much love in himself that he wanted to pour it out and invite you into it. Isn't that an amazing God? Wow. So that's the first relationship that we see in Scripture is this fun doctrine of the Trinity. Let's move on then. What about then the first human-to-human relationship? Genesis chapter 2. We were in 1, now we're going to go to 2. Here's how I like to think of Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 is going to be the wide lens. You're seeing a lot happen all at once. You're not seeing in close detail things happening, but you're seeing a lot happening. Then Genesis 2, the lens tightens up. You get out the binocular, the telescope, and you're looking more acutely and accurately as to what is going on specifically as it relates to to humanity and how God relates to humans. Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We're going to skip to verse 18. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. I need to get this dude in relationship with somebody. And what's so neat about this passage is you read through the Bible, this is the first time you're going to see where something is not good. In the Genesis 1 creation account, there, there's uh, this really beautiful poem, how it's all laid out. There's 10 different times that God speaks. And every time that God speaks, something is created, and Scripture tells us that that thing is good. God spoke, light was created, light is good. God spoke, the waters separated, that separation was good. It's good, it's good, it's good. And then we get here to chapter two and we find out that it is all of a sudden not good. So what's the first not good in scripture? It's not good that Adam should be alone. If Adam is created in the image of God, which he is, and God is forever in community with himself and invites us into it, well, if Adam is made in the image of God after a relational God, 
then Adam too should be a relational being. He's made to image and represent God. And so Adam being by himself, that's not the Eden intent. He's meant to have somebody else to be in relationship with. This idea of not good at being alone, this is something that has popped up a lot recently in different medical studies. This was something from the, the CDC right here. Really interesting. So, uh, you know, a collection of different reports on loneliness saying that those who are lonely have a 50% increase in the probability to get dementia in older age. Those that are lonely have a 29% increase of heart disease. 32% elevated risk of stroke, 68% higher rate of hospitalization, and they go to the ER 57% more often than those who are not lonely. Loneliness doesn't just affect the mind and the soul, it affects the physical body. But you didn't need to hear the stat that loneliness was an issue, because you know this intuitively. You know this experientially, don't you? Because some of the worst mistakes that you've made and that I've made have come out of a place of loneliness. When we were feeling like we're by ourselves. That feeling of loneliness can kind of put that blindfold up, can't it? And it can lead us wandering, (laughs) trying to hit our goals and ending up somewhere We didn't want to be. Ending up in the arms of that man, the arms of that woman, ending up with those people who really drug us down and through some years of pain. All for trying to escape this feeling of loneliness, searching, seeking for somebody to accept us, right? We personally know the heartache that comes from loneliness because we are meant to be in community with other people, but not just with anybody. And this is where the wisdom factor comes in. So here's what we're gonna do. We're going to look at a few different verses. Uh, When when I read those to you earlier, I I skipped some verses intentionally. We're gonna go back through those and we're gonna check out uh, what God has to say between the time that he created Adam till the time that he creates Eve. Because right after he says, man, it's not good that man should be alone. Uh, God does like the first surgery, I guess you could call it that. Kind of like makes Adam fall asleep, takes a rib, fashions a woman out, and then here's a woman um, in front of Adam. And Adam is elated. Adam is like now singing a song. In fact, I'll, I'll read this to you. Let me, let me go back in my notes here. I love this. When, when I picture like this little song that he sings here in Genesis 2, I think of like the old school Disney character. Think of like Snow White era. Uh, where they sing kind of like this, and it's a little bit awkward. Um, Adam is like singing to Eve after she's created. He goes, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. All right, that's beautiful. This is there, therefore, the commentary hits in here, biblical commentary. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. That's a pretty good ending to that part of the story right there. They're on their honeymoon here. But between God making Eve and God making Adam, there's a few verses that are critically important for us to get and to glean wisdom out of because they show us what it looks like, first of all, to be an individual in relationship with God before we're in relationship with another human. Now, I don't just mean a romantic relationship, but any relationship here. So before we pursue a a human-to-human relationship, there is an us-to-God relationship that takes place. So we're gonna check that out. We're gonna go through this quick. If you're taking notes, now's the time to do that. Uh, A few things that God gives. First of all, he gives a place, Genesis 2, 8. It says, now the Lord God planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man that he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye, and they were good for food. In the garden, yeah, there was also the tree of life and the knowledge of good and evil. 
God creates man and he puts him in a very specific place. And this was going to be the place that God would provide for Adam. Eden was God's place of provision. He placed him there. And likewise, God places you. And not just in a physical, material sense so that God can take care of you, although I'm sure that you can look back on your life for those that you have followed God for a while and go, oh man, yeah, God did take care of me in that place. Like I thought I was taking a job for this reason, but turns out it was for something totally different or I ended up here. I don't know how I got here, but God used that place to provide for me for that period of time. Does God do that? Totally. Well, let's talk about spiritual provision for a second. God uses a place, a people, a community that he'll bring you a part of to provide for your spiritual needs. And for so many of you, you've found that here in this congregation, what we call active church, in this place, and you gather together on a Sunday. I'm proud of you. Well done. You're here. And I just want to encourage you, if this place has helped to meet your spiritual needs, right, if, if, if this is providing that rich fulfillment for your soul, make this a priority in your calendar. Guard this at all costs. If this is a place that God is using, man, make it a holy place in your calendar. If your life group has been that for you, make that a holy place in your calendar. Make sure you, nothing gets in the way of that. If this is the, the community that God's going to work and provide for my soul in, make sure you guard that place. Would you do that? God uses a place. <laughs> he uses a place to take care of you. Make sure you're guarding that time. God provides a place. He also provides a purpose for Adam as well. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Adam wasn't just going to sit in a lawn chair or a rocking chair and just kind of rock on the porch of the Garden of Eden until, I don't know, until he goes away, I guess. That wasn't it for just for him to do nothing. He had a purpose. In paradise, this is the ideal, is that he would have a purpose. God created Adam on purpose, for a purpose, and you're the same way. He's created you on purpose, for a purpose. What that purpose is, he has it pre-assigned and ordained, but you get to discover it. And that's the fun part. And your purpose is going to look different than my purpose. And your purpose right now might be raising up some kids to love and serve God. Because we've got a weird world that we're raising up children in right now. And you get to be a light shining bright in your home. Maybe that's your chief purpose right now. What a noble purpose that is. Maybe your purpose right now is to go out and crush it in the marketplace. Talk about being salt and light and in a competitive environment and dark environments. Maybe it's your job just to go out to do things with ethics, to not take the deals that other, pe other people will take, but you're gonna lead with integrity and people are gonna see that. Maybe it's that you're going to amass some sort of wealth, that you're gonna leverage your resources, your talents, your abilities to further the kingdom of God. Maybe that's part of your purpose right now. Praise God, what a wonderful purpose. Whatever that is, you have a purpose, but I, I can promise you this, whatever it is, it's related to people. Your purpose will be fulfilled in some way, shape, or form having to do with people and serving them. Keep coming around church, pray with people, read your Bible. There's, there's books, there's volumes written on this. You owe it to yourself to figure out not what your end all be all purpose is, but what's your purpose right here, right now in this season of your life. Man, let's discover that. Purpose is tied to identity. Purpose asks, what am I supposed to do, right? Identity asks, who am I? And in this passage, we just looked at it a little bit ago, it'll be the third time we check it out now. Genesis 126, it hits on identity. God said, let us make mankind in our image. That's you, made in the image of God meaning to be a representative of God, to be like a mirror that bounces the reflection of God, the character, the nature of God off of you unto other people so that other people would go, I know what God is like because I see how his church works. That's the ideal. Overall, we do a pretty poor job of that, but the ideal is that we would image and reflect God to other people, that we would be his image. 
you know, this is one of the reasons why God throughout the Old Testament and the New uh, says again and again, don't make images after me. Yeah, the, these, these, there's these other tribes and nations. They, they make these gods. They fashion them out of gold and silver. Don't do that. Don't make an image of me. Why? He says, because you're my image. <laughs> you're my image. Don't make another one because that would be downgrading who you are at your core. You're made to image and reflect me. Why do I bring that up? Because this is where we get in relational trouble sometimes. It's because if we forget our identity, we forget our worth. And if we forget our worth, the blindfold is up and we start looking for worth. Will you love me? Will you accept me? Will you take me? And you won't have to stumble long until you find a group of people that will accept you or take you or ascribe worth to you. That's why it's critical that we get our worth from God so that we're not being defined by another group of people that just happens to accept us. Amen? Let's move on. God gives a place. He gives a purpose. He gives parameters as well. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat fruit from any tree in the garden. Adam, you see all this? Go for it, dude. It's all yours. I've taken care of you. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Saying, hey, Adam, (laughs) this is going to hurt you. If you go over here and take this and touch this, this is gonna be bad news for you. So Adam, in your mind, put up a guardrail around this thing so that you're not gonna get messed up. You can say, man, what what kind of a cruel God would put up a test or a challenge like that? Okay, what kind of an amazing God would say, hey, here's an issue, stay away from it, which is not what our world does. Our world says, let your heart be your guide, go, and then run off into destruction. But our God is very clear to lay out parameters saying, if you do this, if you go there, man, that's gonna mess you up. And that's really what this series is about. And we're talking a little bit more high level today. Pastor Adam's gonna be back next week. We're gonna get into it and we're gonna talk out what are some of those real specific parameters that we can follow uh, to make sure that we're hitting our targets well. But this is just the one note that I would leave with you on this one. As you're asking, what what are the parameters uh, concerning relationships? Oftentimes we go to, is this right or wrong? Right or wrong? Which is not a bad question, but I think there's a better question that we can ask. Instead of saying, in this relationship with these friends, with this woman, with this guy, with my kids, is this right or wrong? A better question is, is this wise? Is this wise? Where I'm wanting to go in the future with this relationship, where I've been in the past, and where I'm at right now, is this the wise decision for me to make right now? Wouldn't that be a better question? Wouldn't that have been a question earlier in your life? If you would have asked, it would have saved you some trouble? Me. God gives a place, he gives a purpose, he gives parameters, but most importantly, God gives himself. What did God give Adam in the garden before he brought along Eve? God gave himself to Adam. Peter, the, one of the apostles closest to Jesus, would reflect back on his time with Jesus, his ministry, after Man, decades of missions work, expanding the kingdom of God, intense persecution. He would look back on his time with Jesus and he would look back on this creation account and look what he would insert into this. This is 1 Peter chapter one. He says, since you call on a father, notice that relational term that he chooses. He's talking of God, right? Father, son, spirit. Since you call on a distant God, now, since you call in a father, he's close, who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time here as foreigners, here in reverent fear, for you know that it's not with perishable things like silver or gold that you are redeemed from the empty ways of life handed down to you from your ancestors. He says, but what redeemed you, what your father purchased to adopt you, when you go to adopt a kid, you pay some money. What did God use to adopt you so that you could call him father? The precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, 
but he was revealed in these last times for your sake. In this creation account, God knew it was gonna happen. He knew Adam would turn and he knew all of his children, you and me, would do the same thing. That we would turn and reject relationship with him to go out our own way. He knew that from the beginning, from pre-Genesis 1-1. He knew what would happen, but it was something that he was willing to do because he loved you that much. Creating us so that we would reject him. So he would come to this place to die for us so that we could be adopted back into his family. He gave himself to Adam and you and I from the very beginning. In John chapter four, Jesus is with his disciples and they're going on a journey as Jesus always seemed to be doing, traveling from one place to the next, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he decides to take a detour and go to Samaria. I don't like detours, but I definitely don't like detours through rough neighborhoods or towns, right? And this was certainly a, a rougher neighborhood, you could say, because Jesus being a Jew, all of his disciples being Jews, wouldn't have been caught dead in normal circumstances in a Samaritan village. Uh, they, they, did, they clashed with each other greatly. Uh, the, the Jews very much so looked down on the Samaritans. The Jews were Jews and the Samaritans were half Jews. And if you're a half Jew, you're no Jew and no good. And so the, these two groups were very conflicted. And so Jesus does what no normal Jewish rabbi does. So he goes to this Samaritan town and he gets to the outskirts of the town and they're tired. He's been with his disciples and he says, hey guys, here's the money, go get food, go get water. I'm just gonna chill here over by this well. They're like, all right, never been into a Samaritan village. First time for everything, here we go. So his disciples go away, Jesus is alone for a divine appointment. A woman comes up to this well to draw water out, which would have been extremely peculiar because women don't travel alone and they don't travel in midday. They're gonna travel to the well together in a group for safety. And they're gonna go in the morning, not in the heat of the day, to carry back heavy pots of water. But this woman wasn't accepted by the other group of women, and we'll find out why. And Jesus says to her, I just picture Jesus chilling off to the side doing one of these. She puts her bucket down, is hoisting it back up, and Jesus says, uh, hey lady, can you give me some water? And she can't believe it. Nobody talks to her, especially not a Jew, especially not a rabbi. Are you talking to me? You want me to give you a drink of water? <laughs> Let's see what Jesus says. John 4, 10, Jesus answered her, uh, hey, miss, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that's asking you for a drink, you would have asked him, you would have asked me, and I would have given you living water. Sir, this woman said, you have nothing to draw from this well. Uh, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Are you doing that Jew thing? Like you think that you're better than, than our people right now? You think you're better than Jacob and all of his kids that actually dug this well for us? He says, listen, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said, all right, sounds pretty good. Sir, give me this water so I don't have to come here again. This is a hassle. I don't like this. I don't like coming up here. Give me your living water or whatever so I don't have to come back up here. He said, okay, cool. Hey, go get your husband and come back here. Um, I, uh, I have no husband. Jesus said, you're right when you say you've had no husband. In fact, You've had five husbands. And the man that you're with now, he's not your husband. So what you just said is actually true. <laughs> Dude, Jesus read her mail. 
This is before the days of like Facebook creeping and stalking people, right? Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet, right? (laughs) I know there's some sort of divine thing happening because you know me inside and out. What's Jesus getting at here? He's saying, hey, miss, you come up here because your physical body gets thirsty every day, but your soul is longing too, isn't it? He says, I've got living water that can quench any thirst, that can quench that deep thirst of your soul. You know that thirst that drives you from one man to another, another failed relationship, and another, and another, and another, Jesus says, I've got the remedy to that. I've got the cure. I've got living water, and it's yours if you'll follow me. After this interaction, the woman went back (laughs) to her town. She goes back and says, y'all not going to believe this. There's a guy up here who told me everything that I've done. He's talking about living waters. I think this is the guy. I think this is that Messiah. The town goes out there to hear from Jesus and it's some Samaritans that turn and follow him. Jesus says, I've got living water. And he offers that to us today. Yeah, he gives us a place, he gives us a purpose, he gives us parameters, but he freely gives of himself so that before we would pursue relationship with somebody else, we go to him to get filled because it's not my friend's job to fill me up. It's not my spouse's job to fill me up. It's not this Relationship, this boyfriend, this girlfriend that I'm pursuing, it's not their job to fill me up. They can't fill me up. It's unfair that I would even look to another human to fill me up. But there's only one that can fill me up, and it's my maker. And he offers himself freely to us. What would it be like if we took Jesus up on that promise, if we were like that woman? where you say, all right, I'm gonna drink from you first. How would it affect your relationship with your kids? This pressure, this burden maybe that they feel from you? Or or maybe the lack of pressure because you're afraid that you're gonna push them away like you were pushed away from your parents. Would that subside? Because you're drawing from a deeper well than the performance of your kids? Well, how would that impact your relationship with your spouse? your boyfriend, girlfriend, if you're not looking to them to fill you up, but instead looking to your creator? How would that help a relationship with your friends? You feel let down by your friends that you put in more effort than they do, and it's just, it's again and again and again, or if you realize, oh, they're not supposed to fill me up. I want them to push me and encourage me to be better. I'm gonna do that to them, but I don't draw my significance from them. Why would I be disappointed in them? I'm looking for something they could never give me because that's found only in the goodness and the grace of Jesus. We're gonna get practical over the next few weeks as we talk about this, but I hope you would leave here today just recommitting to fill up first on Jesus, to draw significance, to draw worth, to draw value, to draw from that beautiful dance of love in the very nature of God himself that he invites you into.